Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Buck Stops Here. I'm Catherine Murray. I feel like I'm saying this every week, but we do continue to see very volatile markets and markets that continue to trend lower. Specifically, of course, the driver this week is what we heard from the U.S. Fed Chair Jerome Powell yesterday, raising rates by 75 basis points. That was expected, but perhaps the hawkish tone was not as expected as obviously the market was pricing in because the market was down by about 1% and continues to trade quite mixed today. Uh, we, I, of course, uh, do pre-tape this. Um, to get some perspective for you in terms of where we think the market might be going, how to position yourself, is the Fed gonna go too far too fast and cause a hard landing? Those are all the commentary that is occurring right now. Let me bring in Dave Burrows. He is the president and chief investment strategist at Barometer Capital. Uh, a face and a firm that I think is quite familiar to many of you. Um, David, great to be with you today, and thanks so much for joining us. It's great to see you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I, I think we really have to start with what we heard from the US Fed yesterday. Obviously, you know, reiterating what he said at Jackson Hole continues to somehow surprise the markets. How are you interpreting where the Fed is and what you think they're actually going to be doing and the impact that will have. Right. Well, you know, you, you really sometimes have to separate the words from the actions. Uh, they've been pretty clear about what their plan is, which is to tighten financial conditions. They made it clear early on they wanted to front load the action because they felt they had a pretty strong economy to work against. They felt they needed to work fairly quickly. And they want to use all the tools that they have, including the bully pulpit. So they have an opportunity when they do these meetings to vocalize what they would like to see happen. And whether or not they follow all the way through on the things they're talking about, they're trying to make sure that people understand that there are tighter financial conditions coming. That may just in itself cause people to hold back from consumption, hold back CEOs from major investment and, and help the supply chain to catch up and try and tamp down some of the early pressures on wages. Hmm. So do you think then it is the right move? I mean, so many times when we've seen federal chairs uh, raise rates, they so often cause recessions. We, we know that Fed Chair Jerome Powell is a fan of Paul Volcker going back to the 70s and the recession that ensued, hard landing, a very hard landing. We've got a hot housing market here in Canada. I mean, how much risk is there that they're going to raise rates far too aggressively and, and really cause a lot of pain in the broader economy that will last longer than anticipated? Well, you know, you have to remember that only a few months ago they were saying we aren't even thinking about thinking about raising rates. And as the data changed, they had to change their tune. So I think in some ways they're embarrassed that they are behind the curve. Uh, as Stanley Druckenmiller described last week at a meeting I was in, that uh, that they're like reformed smokers. Not only have they quit smoking, but they want to talk about it all the time. And the reality mm -hmm. is that they're they are behind the curve, and so they've tried to tighten quite quickly. But they're going to remain data dependent, and if the data really starts to slow, their tune can change fairly quickly. But in the short run, they don't see that as risk because the employment market is so strong. Uh, they want to try and get out in front of this. Right. Um, I mean, it, in, in many ways, it, it does make sense. Um, but at the same time, too, I think that a lot of people have lost faith in the Fed because, as you say, they weren't even thinking about raising rates. And now they're playing catch up. And now the concern, of course, is that they're going to go too far. I mean, you look at the fixed income market today. It's pretty astounding that the U.S. 10 year yield is 3.6 percent. The two years at 4.1 percent. I mean, the fixed income market who are they're supposed to be the smartest guys and girls in the room. Uh, they're concerned that there's going to be a hard landing. Yeah, well, there's there's no question that we went through a very significant regime change, you know, starting in 2020. And, it, you know, it's, it's strange for us. We've really avoided any kind of fixed income over the last two years. Uh, and, and actually, we're, we're short fixed income for quite some time. And the problem for investors is that their experiences have all been in the last 40 years during relatively falling rates. And it's just not the case today. And so yeah. it really calls into question all of the things that they believe work from an investment standpoint um, and, and really have to reconsider the way they've structured their portfolios. Absolutely. Um, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the themes that you and your team are thinking about and employing for your clients' portfolios. And also, 
to rethink what we think works now and what might work over the next two to five years. We'll be right back. David, I want to pick up on something that you said in the previous segment, which I think is really important, and it's how people have to think about investing today. And perhaps, you know, it is different versus, you know, what people were taught to do going back over the past 20, 30 years in terms of the uh, equity versus fixed income weighting and cash in their portfolios. I, I think that I mean, you needed to be on top of that about two years ago, at least. But um, but people are still obviously playing catch up. So what do you mean uh, as it relates to kind of rethinking your portfolio construction? Well, you know, um, I, I started doing work in media in 2000 at the end of the tech run up. And the view was you just bought good quality stuff and held it forever. And, and my view was really the world had changed. And you have to look at the world you're moving into, not the world you've been in. We've had 40 years of falling interest rates, and that has been a significant driver for revaluation of lots of different types of assets. You know, most obvious would be real estate, uh, but of course, growth stocks are the same. The lower the rates went, the higher the multiple you could pay for future earnings. And so as a result, these things that did well during falling rates became a very large part popular indices. So mm -hmm. now that we're in a different environment and rising rates are challenging those valuations, they're having an inordinate impact on the indices themselves because they're made up so heavily in these same types of groups. Now, on the other hand, the groups that do well in a more inflationary environment became a tiny piece of the indices. And so things like energy in the S&P is less than 5%. It was 2%, you know, only, only 18 months ago. And so uh, it raises the specter that you have to step back and say, am I in the right spots? And, and if you're a passive investor in indices, it's tricky because those things may underperform for a very long period of time while the over ownership unwinds itself. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and, and that is one of the key questions though, right? In terms of, again, going back to the US Federal Reserve, they're obviously on this path of raising rates. At the same time, though, David, we are still at historically very low rates. And in fact, if they are data dependent and things get slower, I mean, there's the possibility that not only will they stop maybe mid-2023, they could even go back to lowering rates once again. So it's very difficult to kind of continue to maneuver in this environment. That's, it's, it's true. So I think that really what we have to do is we have to build portfolios that are that are set up for different types of environments. At, at Barometer, we focused on a couple of things. One, the tailwind over the last two years has been on sort of inflationary, reflationary assets like energy or basic materials. And frankly, you know, financials fit into that camp as well uh, after a long period of unhospitable you know, conditions for those sectors. The, the, so you have, you have to have one piece that is maybe inflation is stickier than you think. We have to have a piece in the portfolio that will address that. The second thing is it may be that they tighten too much and cause an accident, and it may be that confidence continues to wane, so you need some defensive characteristics in the portfolio. And so, you know, high dividend, less economically sensitive groups like utilities and consumer staples, you know, there's a reason why their relative performance has been quite good so far in the year, because people are looking for some of that certainty. And then, and then the last piece mm -hmm. is, you know, you don't have to be invested all the time. It's probably not a bad time to have some short-term deposits uh, or even very short-term bonds. You know, you're you're looking at four percent. You know, on a on a two-year, uh, not not so bad as a place to hold some cash and leave, keep yourself some optionality in the portfolio in the meantime. But but these yeah, I think are absolutely. all important concepts. And so I, I think we should also point out. I I, I believe because I've been interviewing you and and your colleague Dana Avigdor for years. Um, that your approach is really quite nimble in terms of looking at the scenario and repositioning or making tweaks, correct? And yeah, there, I, I think that that's the part of this skill right now. Yeah, I, th I, think, I do think that you have to be tactical, right? We are not in a world where there is any certainty. So you have to you have to have your positioning and then you really have to use risk management. 
You can't afford to let a little mistake turn into a big mistake. We have energy in the portfolios right now. There is risk that they do create demand destruction and that the price of oil falls. And these, this last group that's been pretty strong could get hit. And you know, you can't be, uh, you can't, uh, you can't ignore that fact. So you need to be ready to do something on that as well. Right. Um, and, and from a, um, an avoidance perspective, um, I want to hear a little bit about the areas that right now, given how you view the world, what you would specifically be avoiding. Uh, but we will take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, David, I do want to pick it up uh, in, in terms of something you mentioned, uh, you know, to me prior to, to uh, the program today, um, but areas that you and your team are avoiding. You don't hear a lot of people really in the investment industry say they're avoiding certain areas. Um, they don't normally just say they're overweight or neutral. Um, so what are you specifically avoiding right now? Right. Well, you know, Catherine, we're very lucky because we have a completely open mandate, which means you know, we can be anywhere and we can avoid anything. And and I think we're in one of those times when there's some big parts of the market we have to be careful of. You know, the biggest part of the U.S. economy is the consumer and consumer discretionary as a group has been very tricky over the last number of months. Some of the very biggest companies have had a hard time uh, and it's had a big impact on the indices. And of course, the elephant in the room is technology and they are growth companies. They do grow but people have paid a very high multiple and the multiple has expanded over time. And so what I've found is that the difference in price from where a momentum investor stops buying and where a value investor steps in can be significant. And we know mm -hmm. from the tech wreck between 2000 and 2003, there were some pretty big declines and people don't want to live through those things. You know, I remember arguing with people about being time to sell Nortel and they said, well, we can't sell this Nortel. Well, you can make the same argument about an Amazon or an Apple. They're great companies. Mm. It just might not be the right stock to own right now. So we're avoiding yeah. consumer. And do you think that? I, I, I do. About... I do. And at some point there will be a bounce. The problem is they continue to be overowned. And in fact, as of a month ago, hedge funds were more concentrated in the top 10 names than they have ever been. And private hmm. investors in general do have faith in those companies and they're great companies. It just may be they underperform for a long period of time as the multiples come down or they grow into their grow into their earnings. So I'm not talking about unprofitable right. tech. That's very tough. But but even large yeah. cap tech, which many of them have just broken to new lows, which opens the door to lower prices. The last group that I think yep. we have to be careful of are the communications companies. And you know, you put Google in that camp and so on, a big part of that, of that, of that index. And so those three places are pretty, pretty big parts of the market. And I think that you can just be stepped aside from those for now. Hmm. And, and what industries, it sounds like energy, you're still going to continue to be long in, but what, what else do you think is an area that you would want to have ownership in today? What do you feel comfortable owning? Well, you know, we're all about finding uh, industries or themes where there is a structural backdrop that will go on for a long time that maybe is underappreciated. So when I talk about materials, a tiny piece of the, of the S&P, a bigger piece of the TSX, but clearly there are structural issues. For 15 years, there was underinvestment because they were in a bear market takes a long time to put new production into play. And yes, a, a slower economy will have an impact on, on consumption, but you have EV coming along, which is gonna demand a lot of metals, for instance, and battery materials. Uh, hmm. China is trying to stimulate, they just announced a giant infrastructure project, a uh, set of projects that will use a lot of materials. You got a war going on uh, where there's a lot of materials being consumed. And we have an agricultural shortage globally that means that agricultural materials are going to be important. So mm -hmm. um, I, I get it that that people concerned get concerned about a, an economic slowdown, and financial players have moved away from these groups, even though they were under owned to begin with. But if you look at it today, uh, they still are on a relative basis over the course of this year outperforming, 
and they and they may be quick to come back on any sign of strength and you're not yeah. fighting a group that's over owned by everybody so right. i think in lots of different markets you you have to recognize there are spots that you can be where the risk reward is pretty good where the valuations are okay and they there could be a long runway in front of you and that's that's interesting you know because you really don't hear a lot of people talking about owning materials right now and to your point you can see it in the uh lack of ownership, you know, just from a, a waiting perspective per se. Um, I was actually personally looking at BHP the other week, which almost seems a bit crazy. If you look at the dividend yield, it's telling you that there's a big problem. Uh, but I don't know. I, I don't mind going, you know, long, a uh, high dividend paying stock. If, of course, it's going to continue to be in business, which you would think BHP would. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a whole a whole number of upstream resource companies that are not probably a bad place to be for for yield and if inflation stays sticky um you know the yields could go higher over time okay we'll take a quick break we'll be right back You know, David, certainly a lot of people are continuing to look for income and for savers and retirees. They've been so negatively hurt for the past number of years because of the lower for longer rates. We might be in a period, though, where we've got a little bit more elevated rates, interest rates um, versus what we've been experiencing. And of course, people also want to look at dividends um, to supplement their income and also from a tax perspective. So what what's the key item that people need to be aware of when they look at dividend companies or dividend stocks? If, Catherine, if you look back at what happened in the 1950s, last time we saw a generational bottom in yield was the end of the first Second World War. And and through the decade of the uh, 60s and into the 70s, we had a series of bumps of higher rates and they would rise and then pull back and then rise further and pull back. And during that period, the cohort that did the best were companies that not only paid a dividend, but had an inordinate ability to grow their dividend. And eventually, of course, they became the nifty 50, which were the highest valued companies in the market by the 1970s. And so if you believe that investors may get frustrated with the fact that higher rates mean their bond prices go lower, uh, they may want to find something with a rising stream of cash flow. So we're big in believers at, at Barometer and in owning assets that can give us a rising stream of cash flows or, or good getting better. And so uh, if you looked at it, dividend growers since the mid 80s have returned about 10.7% a year in the TSX, which is, is mm. better than any other cohort, high dividend payers, the, the composite dividend cutters uh, or companies that didn't pay dividends. What's more valuable is that they were the lowest volatility cohort that you could have invested in. So there's a free lunch. You get a rising mm -hmm. stream of income to offset what may be a more inflationary environment, and you get it with a much lower volatility or standard deviation in the market. So I think that's a pretty good combination. So we really spend mm -hmm. a lot of time trying to find things that will pay us a decent yield, but where we could see above average dividend growth going forward, which means we're gonna get paid a little more over time. And are there certain sectors within the TSX that lend itself to that scenario more so than others? I mean, are are they the financials? Are they the telecom companies? Well, the financials have been have been there, but as we talked about just before the break, uh, over time, you know, if you get the cycles right, uh, some of the materials and, and commodities companies actually wind up paying really great rising streams of dividends through the course of a commodity cycle, you know, hmm. uh, and so that's that's really interesting. You know, funny enough, uh, in, in our hunt for assets that do this, uh, we came across the asset class of music, music copyrights, owning, owning the mm. royalty streams on music catalogs from songwriters. And so we have a, a fund that, that owns substantially all of the weekend songs and, and a lot of Drake songs and a lot of Justin Bieber songs. And, and the streaming is growing 15% a year. And we just get paid pennies on every time these songs get played anywhere in the world. So I think it's just important to look for this type of asset in a world of rising mm -hmm. rates. People will care about what can pay them more over time. Mm -hmm. And also interestingly as well, to look for some uncorrelated assets and one would think that uh, 
music would, would be that. Um, and I, I suppose as well, you know, you're starting to see other big players come into the market. Well, if you think about it back, back years ago, uh, insurance companies and pension funds decided that real estate wasn't a bad thing to own because the yields that were associated were much higher than what they got in a portfolio of long-term bonds. This is very similar. Uh, the yield is well in excess of what you'll get in the bond market, like like eight nine percent. Uh, there's no sure. economic sensitivity, and and at the same time, though, you know the the cash flows are growing sort of fifteen percent a year. So you know right. these are the types of things that can be revalued over time as people recognize we're in a changed environment. They want a different type of characteristic in the investments that they hold. So just always mm -hmm. important to be looking forward and not get caught up in believing that what has worked over a long period of time is what will work going forward. Right. Well, it is interesting because the pension funds going back many, many years ago would not, correct me if I'm wrong, but would not invest in real estate. And then, my goodness, how has that story changed over the past 20 years or so? Um, well, big change that's, there. It's it's so true. And so when we when we had people say, well, you know, BlackRock, and Apollo Group and KKR have decided they want to be in music. Does that mean it's over? Well, no, it doesn't mean it's over. It's an asset that's beginning to become financialized. And, and that's what you want to see, because that over time causes revaluation of that asset class as other people come to, to, to the market and create liquidity. Absolutely. David, great to be with you today. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for watching as well. Catherine, thanks for having me.